Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. We like to go traveling with you through time and space, sampling the finest of media wares as we go. And this week, we've got a special treat planned. We are going to journey through the days of Marion Ross, both happy and otherwise, but mostly happy. And here's why. It's her attitude. Marion Ross is a joyful person. And joy does not just follow her around. She brings it with her wherever she mm. goes. Marion Ross starred as Marion Cunningham for 11 seasons on Happy Days. She's an award-winning actor of the highest regard, and she's written a book called My Days, Happy and Otherwise. She joins us very shortly, but first, Fritz, let's take a look at one of our reader reviews. Do you have that in front of you? Fritz? I do not, but I just give me a second. Okay, I, you read I, Yeah, right, you read it, it because... This one is, I love the, the screen names they come up with to post these reviews. This one is from Assorted Conversations. And the title is one of my favorite pod finds. Wonderfully engaging and entertaining listen between the guests who appear, plus Fritz and Wheezy. Every episode I've listened to has taught me something, made me laugh, or made me think. If you've ever wondered what Nickelodeon's slime recipe is, I highly <laughs> recommend the Mark <laughs> Summers episode. I double dare you to check it out. Thank you for that kind review. If you write a review in the uh, Apple Podcast Store, we may read it right here on the show. We may even accompany it with a few guitar chords. Fritz, what have you been sampling this week? <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to talk about Adam Schiff's book, Midnight in Washington, How We Almost Lost Democracy and Still Could by Congressman Adam Schiff. You know, at the conclusion of the Trump administration, I promised myself I wasn't going to read any more Trump books. It turned out I was lying to myself and to you, like someone with a porn addiction. My intentions were good, but my problem was bigger than I am. I just finished my fourth book that looks back and tries to make sense of the closing days of that aching hangover that was the last administration. It's Congressman Adam Schiff's Midnight in Washington, How We Almost Lost Democracy and Still Could. That's about as stark a title as you can get. Congressman Schiff is the congressman from the 24th California District. That includes Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, Hollywood, and other areas. He's my congressman. Yay. But that has nothing to do with the respect I have for this man. As you may have noticed, by the way, he led Trump's first impeachment proceeding. Congressman Schiff is maybe the smartest guy in any hearing room in Washington. His analysis in this book of the period between the first impeachment and the January 6th attack on the Capitol is a thoughtful but disturbing reminder of our slow descent into authoritarianism in this country. He talks about his good work relationships, even friendships with Republicans whose consciences were compromised by this cult of personality. He feels that we are in the midst of democracy's darkest hour, and the outcome, quite frankly, isn't certain. This time period has proven that the threat to democracy truly comes from within. Our democratic institutions have suffered some severe body blows and have yet to start recovering. Ever since his role in the first impeachment trial, I've often said that Congressman Schiff seems like the lone warrior for good on this bloody political battlefield. He's been a liberal lightning rod, especially in the former president's cruel and relentless tweets. It's just like the congressman said in his concluding remarks at the impeachment trial. If President Trump is not held accountable, he will continue his malfeasance and anti-democratic behavior only worse. This is a great read, but it, you, you have to steal your stomach to read it because it's, it's, it's frightening. It's very conversational. And I will say this, Fritz, there's a lot of good guys on Capitol Hill. There really are a lot of good guys. So we have to give credit to a lot of people. Okay, there. for all you good guys, we didn't mean to eliminate you. <laughs> so, but did you know, Fritz, that Adam Schiff is reading to me via audiobook. He makes a lovely and informative travel companion. I'm most of the way full, uh, through the book. It's very conversational. And since we all know the story of what happened during the Trump regime, it's interesting to hear it from his perspective perspective juxtaposed with his family life which he had to you know continue walking through the world as a human and uh, and he had obligations that, that were pulling him in various different directions and, and still he kept his head down and got this work done under under an assault from from the other side of things it's very heroic right so uh yes uh absolutely read that book and now here's something different that i'm going to recommend it's called the capote tapes and i found it 
in Apple movies. I think it's also you can pay for it on YouTube and uh, rent it. When Truman Capote died in 1984, he left the remains of a novel he had been hatching and teasing for nearly two decades. And by teasing, we mean appearing on every conceivable talk show to talk about it. The book title was Answered Prayers, and it was to be the story of a budding writer screwing his way through polite society. Naughty, brazen, and amusing, Capote had risen from a lonely and painful small southern town childhood to become the darling of the society set. He ran with a pack of wealthy, fashionable women he called his swans. They included Babe Paley, Slim Keith, Gloria Vanderbilt. They simply adored his wicked charm. But when he spilled vulgar details in a few advanced chapters published in Esquire, his swans turned and swam away. In the Capote tapes, you'll hear audio recordings from George Plimpton's archives and see talk show appearances with Dick Cavett and interviews with Jay McKinnery and Colm Toybean, piecing together Capote's tragic second act. At the age of nine or ten, young Truman entered a newspaper competition with an essay called Miss Busybody, which was all about a local woman who sat on her front porch. She was, in fact, Harper Lee's mother. He got in trouble. He got in terrible trouble for writing it, but he won the prize. So the attention was intoxicating. I found the Capote tapes in Apple movies and it is also available to rent on YouTube. Interesting guy. I think you would like it, Fritz. And I tell you, In Cold Blood is one of my favorite movies of all time, which has a, has a lot to do with him for having, he was the first journalist to, a first writer to sort of become like a Thomas Wolfe and those guys that immersed themselves into yes. a topic and then wrote fictionally about it. But he was, he was an interesting dude. He just became a punchline later, which was too bad. Right. Well, he embedded himself into that world and actually kind of became infatuated with one of the murderers. So it's, there's yeah. a lot of creepy goodness in, mm-hmm. in that book. Mm-hmm. I would like to go from creepy goodness to absolute goodness. Fritz, can I, can I make that turn? It's a tire squealing transition. <laughs> Great, let's do it. All right. For 11 seasons, our guest helmed one of America's favorite television households. They share the first name Marion, but Marion Cunningham was mostly home, and Marion Ross was mostly away from home, portraying a mom who was mostly home. Still, Marion Ross did it all, followed her dreams, raised her real-life kids and her TV kids, and, according to fans, all the kids who were watching at home. Please welcome Marion Ross. Hello, my darlings. We're so happy to have a chance to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, my dear. Well, we just finished your book, and I would say that the resounding refrain of your book is that achieving a dream requires effort. Talk about your dogged determination to realize your dream of becoming an actress. Ah, wonderful. You know, I owe a great deal to my mother, my Canadian mother, Mm -hmm. and she was the immigrant, of course, and she, I was raised, I was a middle child, so I had a crippled brother, then me, and then an older sister. So it was important that I could be, I could be anything, and I wanted to be mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. So I can't imagine being raised in such a way that you didn't have that kind of energy punched into you. It really was a lot of support, and I know that for a lot of your childhood, you kept your dream uh, secret, but as soon as you began revealing it, your your mom was very much behind you, correct? Absolutely. My mother, being a Canadian, Irish-Canadian, it was very easy for her, and I look like my mother. I'm quite a bit like my mother, Mm. so it was was fun for for her to live through me. Oh, that's so... You know, you shot Happy Days at Paramount, which had a lot of history for you because you started your career as a Paramount contract player. And I'm just fascinated by that period of Hollywood history. Talk about those days. The studios literally controlled your lives. Women, I think you'll agree, were not treated as fabulously as they should have been. Talk about being a contract player at a major studio back in those years, Marion. It was it was very important. The studios at that point were very, very important. Paramount, we had 20th Century Fox, Paramount, and then uh, that was it. They were the main ones. And we had great movie stars there. So, and, and the wonderful makeup men, you know, would fix you up and they would get rid of my rosy cheeks. Mm-hmm. And I would feel too bad about that, but that's <laughs> they did that. And, um, it was just, 
I was an actress already by the time I was 22 years old when I was under contract to Paramount. Mm -hmm. And guess who also was there was Audrey Hepburn. Wow. So that's, that's a tough one to take, you know, pretty mm -hmm. damn wonderful. Yeah, know? there's that scene where you're in the makeup chair and you kind of look over and there she is in all her magnificence. It's just, just an Unbelievable. You want to go out and die. That's all. That's <laughs> no, well, you don't need to do that. But, you know, I, I know it's impossible to just kind of measure your own progress against yourself. We're all compelled to measure our progress against those around us. And in the early uh, years of your career, you were constantly wondering, you know, at this age, should I be here and she's here? Should I be there? But you kept that you really kept that under control, didn't you, with positivity? <laughs> Well, it, I, was, I was always pushing myself, always driving myself. And that really come, came from my Canadian mother, mm -hmm. you know, because she was like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's important to have such a strong dream that you're constantly dreaming and planning. I lived in the basement because it was, in, it was cold in Minnesota and we had a, a nice room for the for the uh, the girls uh, in the basement and we had pictures of movie stars on the wall <laughs> and, uh, it just was a uh, very important walk across the ice in the winter it was go to the movies it was thrilling thrilling and you had plenty of space to dream and then and then plenty of opportunity to make your dreams come true because you were always making choices that were that that would support your dream and in for example the the man that you chose to marry i think you know you, you talk about him at great length but i think to a large extent he was someone who you knew wouldn't interfere with your dream ha huh. i don't know if i did but i it, it was so interesting that i could i could just walk right through lots of people because i had such a strong dream and my mother was always there at my elbow or urging me on and I, I went up to Minneapolis, I'm like just turning 16 years old, mm -hmm. so that I could work for a family, take care of their children, and then I could go to McPhail School of Music and Drama. Mm -hmm. wow. That was a good idea. That's amazing, yeah. And the, the war was over in right. about another year or so, and we all got on the train, and we all went to San Diego. Right. That was a, a really good idea. Because we had the Globe Theater there, mm -hmm. and not only that, Hollywood, Hollywood was just up the, up the right. up the hill a little bit. Wow! And I know for you that you felt like it was pulling you further away from Broadway, just your heart's desire. But it's actually pulling you towards your destiny, wasn't it? No, I did certainly think being pulled away from Broadway. Broadway was the goal, mm -hmm. and I must say, I'm glad that that it wasn't the goal because we. I don't know. Broadway was not the way to do it. Even though I was on finally on Broadway with Jose Ferrer, yes, and we and we did a play, you know. Mm -hmm. And I love Jose Ferrer. Yeah. I mean, it was something. He was in he, yeah, yeah, and he, he loved you. <laughs> he was married to Rosemary Clooney at the time. <laughs> no, it's great. I, I I was fascinated to learn that you, you really had established yourself on the stage on, on in particular Broadway uh, before Mrs. Cunningham arrived. I mean, you did Arsenic and Old Lace with Gene Stapleton. You uh, said uh, on a number of occasions that one of the great moments of your career was playing opposite Sir Noel Coward in his play Blythe Spirit, which was a live theatrical presentation on CBS, which they do very seldom anymore. Talk oh. about working with him. He he oh. was a very funny Can you man. Imagine I come over to Humphrey Bogart's house in the, on a Sunday afternoon, look married to Lauren Bacall, because we're going to do a read through of Blythe Spirit with because Sir Noel Coward is going to be there. <gasps> <laughs> I, I had already read Noel Coward's books, and so so this was extraordinary experience. Can you imagine? I can't. No. First of all, you go to Beverly Hills. You go to a beautiful home, beautiful. Lauren Bacall, pretty pretty hot stuff. And here's Humphrey Bogart, and he said to me, "I'm so glad I'm not reading today." You know, performing. <laughs> <laughs> now he was playing with the kids, but the way that you describe Claudette. Colbert is not quite flattering. 
No, she was she was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? Oh. It is. It is. You can't quite picture it, but then again, you always knew when to keep your head down. I I I was well brought up, so I'm a very polite person. <laughs> Why were we all raised to be so blight? <laughs> good, good heavens. Well, an interesting thing you reveal in your memoir is you say that even though you were hobnobbing with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, you, you always, in your soul, always felt like a Hollywood outsider. You didn't really feel connected to those people, but you had your survival instinct took over. I wasn't really hobnobbing with those people. I just existed in some, some of the same atmosphere. <laughs> but I, I tell you, you don't hob- hobnob. And i very envious of who they were, what they did. It was just amazing to me. Amazing. We would do these, we would do the, all these things at CBS live, live. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's really, it's really phenomenal what you got to experience. But I, I'm, I love the moment when you revealed to Cary Grant some important news. Yes, <laughs> I'm doing Operation Petticoat with mm-hmm. Cary Grant. Oh my God! And I'm, I'm sitting. Uh, I'm sitting up on this submarine with Cary Grant and <laughs> telling him about my life. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh God! He was a, really a charming, charming man. He was very nice to me. Yeah. But you were worried about going into the submarine because you had discovered. That's right. I. They said you're going to have to go down in the submarine. I thought, oh. Well, I don't I think that's a good idea. I forgot, what was my fear? But you told Cary Grant that you were pregnant, and I think he's the first person that you told. I did. I did. And he said, oh, are you really? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. And he was, you know, and he was. You know how old I am now? I'm now 80, 83, 83. So oh. I, I forget some of these things. That's perfectly no, that's okay. okay. We're here and we have notes, so we can help you. So I don't know if you go on Amazon and read the reviews for your book, Marianne, but I, I have a couple here that I thought you might enjoy hearing. This one says, um, wow, where do I begin? Other than saying I truly love this memoir, this is so much more than a book for happy days or for Mrs. C fans, but a profound gift of wisdom for any young artist who cares to listen. Unlike many other autobiographies strewn with fascinating tales of old Hollywood, which hers certainly provides, there is a repeated theme of the actions and the mindset that Marion maintained that ultimately led to her success as an actor. So uh, I think that your book is serving not just as all of the fun inside scoops it provides about happy days and your career but also the lessons you know because you don't you don't complain you just get it done and that's just something i think when you look at children what you really hope of all the attributes that they would be blessed with that one would be optimism that's what i got from my mother yeah she she would say you can be anything I said, I will, mother. I will. I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you made her proud. Yeah. Let's let's talk about where Happy Days fits into history. Um, I, I, I had, didn't understand the question. What happened? No, Happy I Day? haven't asked the question yet. I, I was doing a he's, very. He's building. I, I was building toward a dramatic conclusion. <laughs> I, I, I just want to talk about where Happy Days happened in American history. I mean, it happened in a time when America had survived the 60s and wasn't really sure where we were headed in the 70s. So it 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 was the first of the nostalgia wave, I think. It harkened back to what everybody thought were simpler, warmer times, loving, happy families, minus the dark conflict of the 60s. Did you have a sense of that while you were doing that show? We, we absolutely did, because Happy Days, first of all, we've got a title called Happy Days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you've got, you've got Ron Howard. I'm Ron Howard's mother. And... We fortunately had Henry Winkler coming in there to be the Fonz, but uh, uh, we it was uh, it was grown up, but not so serious, not mm-hmm. so serious children, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You got to watch the the Fonz phenomenon happen. I mean, when he exploded, and I'll I'll tell you, Weezy and I know him, and actually produced a a pilot with him. 
and got to go around town with him and watch the world react to him. <laughs> and he is, uh, I've, I've met lots of people in show business who are not this way. He is one of the most genuine, warm humans. And it, it wasn't even people's reaction to him. It was the way he reacted very gently and respectfully back to them. Yeah. And I have so much respect for him. Did you have oh. a sense of that before he became the oh, huge star? Oh, lovely. I really did. And I still do. Mm -hmm. Because he is a lovely, lovely man, mm -hmm. a lovely man. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I, it was hard for him because he was unknown when he came. Here's yeah. Ron Howard has been, been a child actor all his life. Mm -hmm. And and all of a sudden, here comes this guy in. And um, he was always absolutely charming and handled it beautifully and fitted in with all of us. And, and uh, we had a softball team and we got him to do all the pitching. <laughs> oh, he was a pitcher. He played softball in his life. All right, he's never <laughs> played softball. So, all right, so now he's going to be the, he's going to pitch everything. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. And we traveled all over the United States. We met everybody. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you got in there and, and you weren't quite the softball expert either when, when it, the team started, right? <laughs> Oh, right. I have a wonderful picture. Can you show show them my picture of me batting in my un, in my uniform here in this room? I loved, I loved, uh, we would travel all over everywhere. And <coughs> see that picture back there? Right there. Wait a minute, Jim. See that? In the red frame. Right. Oh, it's nice. Yeah. Okay. It was so fun because <laughs> it, first of all, it brought us all together. Yeah. Now, can you? Children, can you see? Oh this my weekend? God, that's you so know cute. what? You got good form. Yeah, yeah, so am I. So okay, I, now that you've got a good look, it's like at a, it. a shot from a league of their own. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and we just had a good time. Well, I kept us all together. Yeah, to and have something that you you did outside of the the work to have this additional bonding. Uh, adventures. It's like when I talk to people from Happy Days, the one thing they always talk about is the softball. Do they? Oh, okay. yeah. Anson and, and Donnie, they all talk about the softball. Yeah. Of right. course, Henry. Uh, now, it's been said that fame doesn't change, it reveals. So as you experienced fame descending upon you and your castmates, did you find that to be true? And what did it reveal? Because it wasn't just happening to Henry. It was really happening to all of you, that all of a sudden you'd walk into a grocery store, right? And people would suddenly know who you were. So what did fame reveal as you watched it happen to the entire cast? Well, it was really pretty comfortable, wasn't it? We, mm -hmm. were, we, all, we were always accepted. You know, they came and just put their arms around you. They wanted you there. And, and it, we were not spoiled. So uh, it didn't spoil us in any way, but it, got, it gave us many, many privileges in which we went. We even went to uh, Germany we, and went to Europe. Wow. We went down to New Orleans and played ball you know, down there. I mean, we had many, many wonderful experiences. You, you, you. Where's my bat? Where is my bat anyway? Oh, yeah. she's got a bat, her own bat. Yeah, you, Jim, you. find my bat. <laughs> Poor, Jim's exhausted oh, from Jim's running like, around. Yeah, Jim's got, Jim's but gonna, but you, you you know you you worked on the set with all these uh, younger actors at the beginning of their career. Was this sort of a, a maternal relationship? Did you feel as if you were sort of nurtured? And it was ten years of your life in the pivotal moments, late teens, early twenties. You must have felt like you were sort of escorting them through some pivotal moments in their lives. Oh yes, I was treated like a mother. And they would come and sit beside me and tell me their little secrets and things like that. So it was, I, I, I wanted to be a mother. I didn't want to be some hot item, you know. <laughs> well, I think you were both, but okay. <laughs> now, Erin Moran says in your book that you are the most wonderful person she has ever known. Oh. Were you aware that she felt this way about you? Uh, I wonder if I did. I think I did. Because she was a darling girl, mm -hmm. and and she had a terrible uh, home life, and it was a, she played a big price. You know, my son Jim <laughs> is bringing me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see this, children? Look at you. you. Yeah. Okay. Your name is on the pot. Pretty nice. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Can we see Jim? Can Look we... at that. You still have oh, Jim. Have Jim come over. We want to see Jim. What, what do you want to see at the end of this? <laughs> Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. That's a face we know. Oh, my name. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's her name on it. Marion Ross, big stick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, it's not a it's not a phony knockoff, Marion Ross. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> funny. Heavy, actually. heavy lumber. <laughs> I'm going to step back. That's impressive. My son is an actor and my daughter is an actor. My, my daughter was a produ- writer producer on Friends, of yeah. all things, shows. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, so we're, we're in this business. You yeah, know? you're in it together. Were you the only one of your siblings who was uh, directed towards show business? Yes, no, her brother. I, your brother did a little bit. Of my it. brother was was a crippled boy, but he but he was a good actor. He was a good he oh, had wow. a very bad a leg. Mm-hmm. And my sister was was shy. She she didn't like him. She was very pretty and had mm. very nice hair. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I I would I always tried to get some attention, if you don't mind. You know. In the forward to your book, uh, which is written by Ronnie Ron Howard. That's your relationship with him, not me. I wouldn't call him Ronnie. Oh, I uh, would. I would call him Ronnie. I never told called him Ronnie. No. You never called him. Okay. Oh, uh, did you have a sense that he was going to be what he became, the, one of the world's great directors? I I always did feel mm-hmm. that the kid was sitting there loaded, <laughs> and um, and 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 you know, meaning what he wanted to do, he would. He didn't want to be to show off in any way. He wanted to be a, a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Yep. When you think of all his big films that he's done, and he's just such a wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful to his brother, Clint. Wonderful. To, and his mother and father have just passed on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Younger than me, I think. But mm. so there you are. You, you, you know Toluca Lake. I used to see his dad sitting at the counter at Patty's Restaurant in Toluca Lake all the time. He was just an average American, lovely man. He, people would come up and talk to him, and he was very attentive to all of them. So it's not surprising that that sort of became hereditary. No, he's a very nice guy. Ron was a very nice guy. Mm-hmm. Treated people very nicely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Marion, are you ready to play some Happy Days trivia? I don't know how sharp you are here, but what? Let's see how dumb I am today. Yeah, but yeah. see, for me, this is easy because the answers are right in front of me. Okay. All right. So, who was Fonzie's idol? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. He wore a mask. Fritz, any guesses? The Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger. No, it's the Lone. I have no. I have no idea. It's the Lone Ranger who I guess eventually appeared in an episode. He did. Yes. All right. Num- number two. Why is Warren Weber nicknamed Potsy? Oh, isn't that something? You can't call somebody Warren. You know what I mean? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's just cruel. It's just unnecessarily oh, cruel. No. <laughs> the answer is he, li- he apparently he liked to make things with clay, and one day his mother called him Potsy. Why did she name him Warren in the first I place? I've never heard that story. Okay, yeah, you just maybe, made it up. Yeah, maybe I've just made it up. Yeah. What yeah. was Fonzie's middle name? Now, you're the only one who called him Arthur, so you may actually know his middle name. You know that I have no idea what <laughs> Arthur's uh, middle name is. It's was. worse than Arthur. Is it? That's your clue. It's Herbert. No, I never. I don't know that. All right, you I might don't. know this one. What was Marion's major in college? Oh, I don't know that there was even any talk about her having been to college. Well, apparently people on the Internet know that she's been to college, and her major was archaeology. Okay. All right. <laughs> Did you know that? No. Well, I, I, want, I want to hear about the, the statue, because you were just honored with a statue in your hometown. Pronounce the name of your hometown for us, would you please? All right. My town is named after a colonel in the Civil War. Oh, it, okay. It was named Colonel Albert Lee. Lee, Albert okay. Lee, L-E-A. Right. And it was during the Civil War, and so it was a darling town built around the lake. Wonderful, wonderful, and a beautiful childhood. Well, so, they have named a lot of stuff after you over there, if you get down that way. You'll see that there's a performing arts center named after Marion Ross. There's a street named after Marion Ross, and now there's a statue. So we... So, I want you to see the statue. Can yeah. you 
you have a picture of the statue? We do. do you, is it, it's in the attachments. We got a picture of the statue, and you and the statue are sitting together very, very friendly. <laughs> um, I think you're getting a little fresh with the statue. You've got your hand on her lap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wow, know. That's I great. don't know, but... It's a sweet town, really nice people. Did you have to sit for the statue for the artist? Yeah. Oh, there we are. Look yeah. at her. Fantastic. There in her dress, mm -hmm. with her little ankles crossed. Okay. She's very proper. Yes, isn't she nice? Mm -hmm. okay. And you wrote that you love where the statue is positioned because you get to look out across the lake where you used to play when you were a child. Exactly. It's so nice to look across the park, down across the water on the lake, and over to the beach. And that's where my friend Muggs, her family ran the beach in the bathhouse. And Aww. we were the lifeguards, and it was great. Ah, oh, that's so cool. How did your family react to your fame, Marion, since you were the first person they, to... <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't make a big, big fuss with me, really. It's... You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. My, it's because my brother was a crippled boy. So a lot of the attention went to my brother, Gordon, who was an awful nice guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's interesting that you always felt like you were, he was the star of the family. And I think that happens in a family where there's someone is ill. That person demands the focus. Oh, absolutely. And then you, it, and then it, you feel guilty and that makes you feel, or you feel angry and that makes you feel guilty and the complicated emotions that uh, ensue. Um, well, it's just a, it was just fun. And we all got on the train and went to California, went to San Diego, where they had the Globe Theater. Wow. How about that? And how did your dad do in San Diego? Did he do better? Did he feel better about the way things were going in San Diego? Uh, absolutely, because the, this is a big Navy base. Right. So he was working for the Navy there. Mm -hmm. All right. So absolutely, he had a really, I think he had a pretty damn good job, you know. And you found a good theater. Not very rich. We didn't have, we we had a, 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 we rented out the upstairs in our house, and I slept down in the basement by the, by the canned goods. You know, they, they got, <laughs> you have to be careful that you don't kick in your sleep because that could be painful. <laughs> but what, what great timing that you ended up in San Diego because the Globe Theater is still one of the preeminent development points for theater that ends up on Broadway in the United States. I mean, their, their reputation is stellar. Absolutely. The Globe Theater, at that point, it was run by Craig Knoll, and Craig Knoll was a close, close friend of mine. And I just... I, I lived there. I mm -hmm. loved it. It was perfect. It's a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk for a moment about Brooklyn Bridge because that's what you did right after Happy Days. And you had to audition many, many times because nobody saw you as a, as a Jewish bubby. But, but you nailed it. Yeah. But you nailed right. it. Yeah, because you're good at dialects. Talk about auditioning for that and getting that role. Yeah. No, I always did dialect. So being mm -hmm. uh, Jewish, as I, I tell you, it was very important to me. And Brooklyn Bridge meant everything to me. And we had a, we had a wonderful cast. And uh, I don't know, we did it at Paramount. It was wonderful there. And you've had lightning strike even more than twice. Uh, listen to this uh, list of credits. Uh, I mean, Mrs. Cunningham on Happy Days, Drew Carey's mother on the Drew Carey Show, the feisty mother on the Gilmore Girls. You've, you're multi-generational. The mother-in-law on that 70s show, even the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants' grandmother. I mean, oh, seriously, you've I'm you've arced. Yeah. Yes, you you've uh, you are multi-generational. What what an amazing career! So, other than being Mrs. Cunningham, your iconic role, what were some of your other high points within that body of work? I was on the Lone Ranger. I, Holy cow! I loved it. I loved well, it. Now yeah. Fonzie's really jealous. <laughs> Who yeah. is that masked man? I said. <laughs> wow, that you was good. Did, you got to say that. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Right. <clears throat> and then and now you do a lot of voiceovers. Not so much. I'm really very retired because I'm so old, you know. But, um, <laughs> it's just I've been having, I've had a wonderful life. And 
I, I, I've done what I want to do. But know? writing the book, how, how many years did that take you? Because I was getting the sense that it took you several years to write the book, that you took your time with it. To write a book, you know, you, you have the front part of the book and then you go along and then <clears throat> it's so interesting. And thank God there's always somebody that's helping you. You know, mm -hmm. thank God. Yeah, so. and, you, and you had David Laurel. It was just an interesting kind of arrangement that you wrote the first half of the book, and then you had your friend David Laurel interview all the key people in your life, including your children. Yes. And right. then, so when you went to read those interviews, were you nervous about what they were going to say? <laughs> no, I mean, what? What? I'm a pretty nice person, so, you know, <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. so but it was fun because David uh, was so generous with me and he would make me talk and i i've just had a good time with this whole skit that i've done with my life mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah well i've i found it really an interesting device instead of you talking to the people or just saying to them go ahead and write something and we'll include it in the book they were actually interviewed so they were sort of prompted and encouraged to remember things perhaps that they would not have so it was it was really fun to read i think so i think so Including Gary Marshall's last interview, and I was a yeah. huge fan of Gary. Gary Marshall was so important to me. Right. Yeah. Talk, talk about him and his relationship yeah. to the other actors what on the show. What a good man he was. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, he was a good ball player, mm -hmm. and, and he, he just, I don't know, took care of all of us. Isn't that something? And we would, when we'd take us all to Europe and and it was just a, a wonderful, he's a wonderful man, he's a wonderful family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's got daughters and a son mm -hmm. in this business and a wonderful wife. Mm -hmm. Gary, my Gary is gone now. Isn't that something? Wow. wow. And did your kids grow up with his kids or did everyone kind of stay home while no, work was kids, happening? No. Our, our kids were never together. Mm -hmm. They were sometimes together on a ball field. Okay. You know? But other, other than that, uh, they didn't want to hang around with actors and things like that, you know. I want to talk for a moment about your relationship with Tom Bosley. You're married to the guy on the show, and at the at the beginning, you didn't really like him. Well, he's he's hard. Did you know him? Did <laughs> no, you know I, don't, him? I didn't know him. No, I didn't know him. No, he's so hard. And and so he was very hard to get to get along with. <laughs> And and he would be rude to me, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. So, <laughs> which made me a very good wife, you know. <laughs> but he's a, but he was so talented, yeah. And he had come from Chicago, and he had gone to Broadway, and you know, he had done really, really well, yeah. And what do you think it was that helped kind of like melt the frost? Was him just getting used to people? No. The frost never melted. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like Gary had a knack for, and maybe he just had a sense of it, you know, the way you talked about how when you hired your assistant, you just kind of looked at her face and said, I love this face, you're hired. Maybe Gary had a knack for putting together a cast that was going to love each other. I think that's a very valid kind of observation because he, he would look at people and, and accept what he saw. Okay. There, you know? yeah. and uh, everybody in our company was a very nice person, mm -hmm. and that was because Gary wanted it that way, mm -hmm. and he picked people like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk about navigating the difficult world between playing the world's happiest mother on this happy show and then trying to raise your own family in the real world and, and giving your children, especially, a sense of what, what is real. That's a, that's a very good question. And because I, yeah, I, I don't think I was very protective of them, you know, mm -hmm. because they just kind of put their, kept their eyes open and just did what they could, you know, but uh, it was a, it was fun. And by putting them, letting them come to the set, let them play ball with us. Occasionally they would have a line, mm -hmm. you know, they could walk in and say a line, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it was just nice, nice, nice people. Always nice people. I think they were they were loved, and they they understood that you were the the chief earner in the household, 
And maybe they, they felt a little jealous of the Cunningham kids, but they also knew enough about show business to know that the Cunningham kids are not real and that they're they're in a time period that no longer exists. And sometimes moms have to work and our mom loves the heck out of us. So we've got a pretty good deal here. That is a very good observation because all even in the community here, these are these mothers are all working. Mm-hmm. You know that. Mm-hmm. And if they're not in show business, they're in advertising. They're, it's, everybody was very, very competitive and hardworking. And you must have made them comfortable because they're all in show business. And they, they sought that out later when they became adults, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we had such a good time together. We, mm-hmm. would, we would go in New York City. We would pick a, a, a restaurant down in the worst part of town, you know, and then, then we would all go there to have a supper, all right? And this is kind of rough and rough neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So here we all are, the whole happiness, cast and crew and everybody. And we, we just had, always we had fun. Wow. Yeah, I think it shows. It shows. When, when the show comes on, do you ever find yourself watching it or do you just think, oh, I've seen this, I know what, <laughs> I don't have to watch this? No, I forget. I forget to watch it. Okay. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. I know you say you're retired, but if if somebody were to come along and present to you an age appropriate role in a Broadway production, eight shows a week, um, would you consider it? What an interesting question. What a tempting idea. <laughs> if, if, if it was something that I really liked, you could get yourself so well organized you know, mm-hmm. that, that you would, might want to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, we're very competitive and ambitious. All of Every one of us was ambitious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No and do you still feel that that kind of... Like you're still supposed to be competitive or do you allow yourself to relax and enjoy what you've already accomplished? No, I I always feel that I should do more, you know, and have have surges of energy and be, you know, uh, wonderful. Aren't I lucky? I've I've had, I followed my dream all the way through, didn't I? Yeah. I mean, what's interesting to me, though, about that is that, you know, the way that you describe it in your book, you always felt like you still weren't there. You always felt like you were in pursuit of the dream. And I'm wondering if that, if that wasn't even a more creative and more productive be, than somebody like the kids on the show that were already famous at 22. You know, you just kept going and going and going. And then in your 50s, Happy Days hit. And it was yeah. only then, I think, that you allowed yourself to really believe that you had achieved your dream. Well, I probably never did believe that I had achieved my dream because it's a it's a constant searching and looking and uh aren't we uh, aren't we fun aren't i think we fun? but don't you think that's what we're meant to do <clears throat> we're just meant um, to we're meant to keep striving right i i always was striving yeah All I, I if i if i was in school and there was a girl who i liked her clothes and her hair mm-hmm. and things, I, God, I, I, I was very competitive. I was very competitive. Right. So. But I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like you were hard on yourself. I think that you took that energy and used it mostly productively. I mean, you talk in the book about being despondent and then shaking it off and moving on. Oh, yes. I didn't, I didn't spend too much time being despondent and, and down. Mm-hmm. No, I, I move on, move on. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful quality. And I think I got that from my Canadian mother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, was, yeah. go ahead, Fritzy. No, I, I, was your mother born in Canada? I'm trying to remember how everybody got to Canada. That's where your parents met, right? Right. She's uh, Irish uh, Canadian, up on, uh, on the wheat farms up there, and she uh, learned to become a teacher, and she taught, and she just was. Smart and cute and ambitious. Mm-hmm. And cute, you know? Now, was she born in Ireland? No, no, she was born in Canada. Right. Do you know what county your people are from? No, I don't. It was Saskatchewan. It was, this was the wheat land. Right. So that when it was wheat time, the, the tractors would come, the, the 
what do you call those things? And they would work on uh, and all of the combine. Yeah, the, the combine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they would come and uh, get all that grain and uh, a lot of stuff. Now, do you have any grandchildren that are expressing an interest in the entertainment business? I have <laughs> grandchildren that are very good looking, I must say. <laughs> Taylor, my she my 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 Taylor is like about you know end of her twenties. Yeah, very very pretty, mm-hmm. and she has naturally red hair. Ah, and uh, she's just smart and wants to become. She, <laughs> you're telling me what to do, so she would she would cue me too. You know? <laughs> yeah. Sees how hard it is. So yeah. when when you see it, how hard it is, uh, you're kind of torn. You can sort of step back. And mm-hmm. think, oh, so how do you, how do you guys feel about how hard it is today when you have all of our attention spread out, all of all these streaming services and all these all the programming? And when you were starting out, it was three networks, and everybody was watching you especially if it was live they were watching happy days there were only three networks and now people can go to youtube and find pick and choose is, is there more work for actors or less work for actors oh boy well isn't that something yeah, yeah. no there was lots of competition but lots of product yeah lots of product night right now right and that's a good thing mm-hmm. that's a good thing you want it go get it go go after it mm-hmm. go get it yeah yeah, yeah. Do you think that um, that your background, your mother's um, agrarian background in Canada, was a good base for you before you came out here? I always love to talk to people, say, I'm so glad I was born and raised in the Midwest because I, I got my roots firmly established and I had a sense of reality before I came out here. So did your mother give you that sort of awareness before you came out here? Yes, my mother... My mother had a lot of personality, so uh, she was very important as far as lighting a fuse under me. Mm-hmm. And since I had a crippled brother and I had an older sister and I'm in the middle, so I responded well. And uh, it just was, and there just seemed to be so much <laughs> outlet. And the, the fact that we went, now I'm, I'm like eight, 16, 17, we moved to San Diego. Yeah. Ah, what do we mm-hmm. have there? We've got the Globe Theater. Right. Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Isn't this wonderful? All this the stuff you loved. And you'd been reading all these plays your whole childhood, so you knew all the plays. Absolutely. I was ready to to be on in the th- mostly the theater, not movies, but, but in the theater. One of the interesting aspects of your story was reading about how you handled advances from men. You were very uh, clear about your intentions, and and so nobody messed with you. But you talk about that a little bit. You know, give give some young women advice when they when they encounter such a thing. Yes, I. It's funny. I don't have much memories of that because I was I was compulsively nice person, a really nice person. Mm-hmm. So that was. A, a little battle that I would have to, and I would watch the other girls that were in like going to lunch mm-hmm. with guys. Right. You know? Yeah. And I think, no, don't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I remember you saying, you know, you went to somebody's apartment or you went and you said, I don't know what you think is happening. And then you just walked out. <laughs> and he gave you a job anyway, showing the scarves at Nordstrom. <laughs> Like, oh, I did. Yeah. That's right. That's in the book. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, Even no. though you turned him down, he still gave you a job. I know. I was very strict with myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you know, you have to be. And I didn't, I, you, I didn't want to watch some of the girls and think, mm, don't do that. Or you would hear people talk yeah, about a girl. Yeah, no, yeah. You know, you'd hear there were a bunch of girls that were all the 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 um, contracted players at Paramount, and you'd hear the way they talked about a certain girl, and then you'd say, "I don't want to be talked about that way." No, no. 
So, but yeah, I think people will do anything sometimes to catch a break. And sometimes they don't know what their rights are or what would, what, what's wise when it's what, you know, when it's actually more advantageous to yeah. say no. Who, and more. Yeah. Who didn't sleep with who, you know, mm-hmm. right. all, yes. all the young actresses, I think lots of them did. So, yeah, I think they feel like they don't, that those are, there aren't any I was already married. I'd run off and, and eloped and gotten married when I was like 22. So that helped. Yeah. I mean, maybe that was a good ballast for you to be able to say I'm married. Yes. No, I'm married. I can't, I can't possibly. (laughs) (laughs) I I love to ask people in your position. um, And there are a few, only a few in your position, but is there a part that you were presented with that didn't seem right for you and you turned it down and it turned out to be some iconic role in a movie that everybody loved? Do you have one of those stories? No, I, I don't have a story like that because if I did turn it down, it probably was something that I should have kept. <clears throat> and uh, now I can remember being being on the Lone Ranger, the Lone Ranger. Oh man! And at, at one point, the the Lone Ranger had to carry me on t- on this horse. Now I'm on top. <laughs> wow! Horse, I can't believe. So it's. It's just been a it's been a wonderful life, mm-hmm. and, and I went with Cary Grant. And we all went, and we were in the army. You know, what was that Operation Petticoat? Operation mm-hmm. Petticoat, and you guys were was it a bunch of women that worked on a submarine wearing pink right. uniform? Yeah, so. all kinds of wonderful adventures. It's been just a joy to read your book, and so thank you for sharing your story well, with us. We really appreciate it. Good. Good. All right, children. Well, we're going to we're going to sign off, but before we do that, Fritz is going to help people find our show. Go ahead, Fritz. If you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, how could you not? It yeah. would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners. If you leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. You may even find us binge-worthy. Many people do. Recent episodes include Gary Puckett and the Cow Sills and Keith Morrison and Henry Winkler. And a few of our friends have made great advances in their career. For instance, we had Dana Gould on here, and he has just been released in Bobcat Goldthwait's new documentary about being on the road that apparently particularly for performers, is wonderful. Sean Pulaski, uh, one of my favorite people and one of the funniest ladies working is touring all over the United States. Look for her, Elaine Boozler, Steve Bluestein, and Wayne Fetterman, and Ed Begley Jr. And I mentioned the uh, documentary about Mr. Kelly's, which is a place our friend Tom Dreesen performed at. So we just like to give shout-outs for them. So yeah. please... Uh, know that we appreciate you spending an hour with us and we would be overjoyed if you took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter where we are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful and beautiful guests, Marion Ross. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.